yeah. There was a talking about um, good records as well, Gareth. You know, like when when I lived in Holland, there were a lot of studies with famine because the Dutch had such good uh, records. What they did was during the Second World War and stuff, when the, when parts of the country in in the Netherlands didn't have any food, then they looked at how that had, has affected two or three generations um, hence. Uh, and it's quite amazing to see how you can track the people with obesity or these genes that have it now that were based on the people that had this gene or that were uh, subjected to famine. And because the records were so good, a white height, weight, all these detailed things, um, that's why it's once again good to know these things because you can sort of change uh, or affect those things. And down the track with CRISPR and all these things, who knows what all bets are going to be off, you know? Well, I interviewed the woman who, who started CRISPR. I, for, for some reason, her name escapes wow. me now. But what an interesting human being that is. And of course, she then, you know, kind of had to sell the technology on. And she had a company that didn't do so well in the, in the immediate wake of that. Sometimes the people who discover something are not the ones who actually make it a success. But the, the idea of being able to, to send in... A, a piece of code as a marker and to be able to remove some and put some more in this is this is the future of, of medicine and i think everyone is aware of that whether we've currently got the capability to actually get there is mm. still a matter of some debate in the scientific community but this is what's interesting about being alive now and i think we are the luckiest people that have ever lived mm. uh, and obviously mm. there are probably generations in the future who will who will look back on us and go god those poor things they were suffering so horribly <laughs> they had no idea of what the world really was about and they, they yeah. seem so primitive just like we look at, at past generations and, mm. and we judge them quite harshly but we are living in a great time there's there's less famine there's less pollution there's less i mean we, there's more forestation happening at the, at the moment than has happened in in two or three hundred years and I saw the UN report come out the other day. Um, I was astounded by this, that apparently by 2030, and the UN are not well known for sending out signals of optimism. <laughs> they said by 2030, there will not be a single person in the world who will be living under the current poverty line. Uh -huh. So the poorest, <laughs> poorest people right now, $3.70 a day or whatever it is, um, within the next 10 years, there will be no one living that poorly in the world. Sure, so that's, that's great news. Generally, we're on a very nice upward trend. You know, human progress is a, is a very powerful thing. And we don't stop to take note of that because we're so busy looking at the bad news of the day and what, what's good. going on right now that is a threat to us and, you know, free speech and existentialism and political shenanigans and the vagaries of a currency, for example. These things are all going to matter less and less in the big picture of history. Um, and we're going to look back and, and say that this was a very good time for humans. Yeah, totally, totally. agree. People, uh, people do love to focus on those negatives and feel like it's, you know, what about gender, all these things. But like you say, our, our general comfort levels are pretty darn good compared to how they used to be. <laughs> but no, um, I mean, that's, just, that's just top level comfort. But for, for ordinary people, there's less conflict than there's ever been in the world. Yes, exactly. I mean, your, your chances of dying violently as a, as a male are so reduced that it's actually a rarity for someone to die violently. And that's why it ends up in the news. So we watch the news and we see that there were, you know, 300 murders in the African continent today. And we go, oh my God, that's awful. That's got to be, it's getting worse and worse. But actually, compared to the 3,000 murders a day that were happening in Rwanda and Burundi during that conflict or in the DRC during the time of Leopold where there were potentially hundreds of thousands of people killed in any given week, um, we really are very, very much more fortunate than any of our ancestors. Yeah. 100%. And, and you know what, Gareth, like it, it's so, it's so great, like speaking to someone like you, because you've, you've made an effort, right. To understand history. And I think that's so important. And, and what lots of people miss out on is like, they, they kind of just living in like this kind of blase kind of way. And they don't actually make that effort to understand what it was like in the world back in the day, because as soon as you start realizing what it was like, you're like, actually, you know what, fuck, I'm actually pretty lucky, like, like you said. Well, this is it. Yeah. I, I, you know, people used to shit where they ate. They used, to, they used to, to eat horrible things. I mean, most of what they ate was raw, and it wasn't because they were on a keto diet. It was because they, they didn't <laughs> have access to anything else. Um, you, you would, 
you would really suffer from morning till night. It was survival mode. There was no such thing as, as being able to engage in this meaningful discussion or debate. There was no such thing as, as therapy. There was no way for you to try and figure out the purpose of life. And, and those things that were being discovered by brave pioneers and by people who were way ahead of their time, like Newton and, and mm. uh, Descartes and these sorts of people, to me, if you don't study what they were going through with an eye to the context of their times, you have no appreciation for where you are. It's that old idea of the fish, uh, the old fish swimming in the tank. And he says to the, the next generation of fish, how's the water? And they go, what water? Because they don't even appreciate that that's what they're living in. You know, we, yeah. we have a, a generation of, of young people, particularly in the first world now, who have grown up with such a degree of ungratefulness for where they're at, thanks to democracy and liberty and, and freedom and, uh, and, and the ability to express yourself and, and the access to the internet. We've got a generation of people who've grown up thinking all of that has always been there. And they have no appreciation for these very, very massive strides. And, you know, I think it was Newton who said, I stand on the shoulders of giants when he wrote his treatise on, on mathematics. Hmm. This is what we have no appreciation for how everyone has toiled and suffered before us from that first caveman who managed to make a spark of fire through all of the, the, the incredible and complex stories of human history to get to where we are now. And for people to, to be complaining right now about, you know, not this, someone's not woke enough or yeah, we, yeah. Don't have, we don't have enough safe spaces is just, it is, it is ungrateful in the extreme, which is why it annoys me so enormously to hear people like that talking. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. And even our, our memories are even very short because Second World War is not that long ago. Mm. And even that feels to me like a, distant thing that's that you yeah. can't really relate to it so it's very hard for people to to go back two three four hundred years and uh, and kind well, of get that, that idea you bring up world war ii and and i've I, I thought maybe if i didn't do what i'm doing the next best thing for me would have been to be a history teacher because i do love it that much and if you don't learn about your past you're bound to have some some mistakes committed in the future which you could avoid but to go to world war ii here both of my grandfathers had to, had to fight the Nazis, right? They actually had no option. They had to put on a uniform, they had to get into airplanes because both, both of them were in the Air Force. And they had to fly over other people shooting them to try and kill them. And they had to try and survive those three to five years that they were in active service. And then they got back and they met my respective grandmothers. And, and all of this might not have happened, but for a bullet. Uh, there might have been some Nazi who was a slightly better shooter who might have taken out one of my grandfathers. And I would not be here having this conversation with you today. And we'd be speaking German if we were. And we would, we would probably be watched by the Gestapo while we were doing it. There certainly wouldn't be podcasts. There wouldn't be the ability to partake in, in free expression and to decide what kind of a breakfast you'd like to have this morning. Those kinds of things we take for granted. And... I also get really annoyed when I hear people saying that they, you know, they've fought hard for whatever they've got. And we don't even know the, the half of that. I, I struggled to get my grandfather to even talk about World War yeah. II mm. because he probably killed people. Mm. And that's not easy for anyone to get over. And when I did ask him about it, he would talk about it in very general terms. And he'd say, well, you know, the, the other guys, and we, we were a strong team and we did a lot together and, it was never really about him. These days, mm. all you hear from people is me, me, me. Mm. All you yeah. hear is, I'm struggling, I'm suffering, I don't have enough money, I'm not at the right university, I'm not allowed to study the course that I want, I don't have this and have that and have the other. And again, it's this, it's this ingratitude which grates me so much. Mm. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change Snowy Cape Fold, mountain range Gotta be quick so 